Okay, I think we are live. Amazing. So, so welcome. I, I don't know why I didn't say welcome. I guess welcome to the people listening online. Mm -hmm. But uh, really, uh, this is a, a wonderful occasion to be here at Mayor and Gadli's house um, and uh, inaugural home, um, a newly married home and uh, hosting a, 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 an amazing class um, that's been going on for a little bit now. And hopefully we can keep, keep up the momentum after uh, after Purim and after Pesach Bezrat Hashem. Um, so thank you to our hosts for uh, for doing this and putting out a nice spread. And nice to see everybody here and everybody listening online. Um, we have a special class tonight because we are just a few days away from Purim. And we are, have already begun the month of Adar. So we started this, this class with uh, speaking about self-growth, self-development. And uh, I think there's no greater month to work on uh, one specific trait than the month of Adar. Some of you probably already know which trait I'm referring to. Mishenichnas um, Adar Marvim Pesimcha. That's a statement, a line found in the Gemara of Masechet Ta'anit, Masechet Ta'anit on the 29th page, Mishenichnas Adar Marvin Basimcha. But when Adar begins, then we are Marvin, we increase our happiness. Today is going to be a lighter class than normal. I'm going to, I'm going to share with you a lot of really, really amazing stories, though many ideas. In this surrounding this concept of simcha, marbim be simcha. It doesn't say when Adar enters, we start to be happy. It says, mishenichnas Adar marbim, we increase happiness, which implies that we're already happy. That we're already, we're supposed to be happy. We're supposed to be happy all year. Not just Adar. Just this month, we increase happiness. There are many places that, uh, that write that we're instructed to be happy. Um, we all know the, the songs. Many of us know the song, Mitzvah Gedola Liyot Besimcha. Are you familiar with that song? Mitzvah Gedola Liyot Besimcha. It's a mitzvah, it's a great mitzvah, Liyot Besimcha. So I got news for you. That line, it's not a pasuk. Um, it's not a gemara. Mitzvah Gedola Liyot Besimcha. It's not even a statement from the rabbis. It just was a line that sounded good to make a song. It's not one of our 613 commandments either. So it's not technically even a mitzvah to be besimcha. It's important to be happy, but no one actually really said this line. At the same time, on the other hand, David HaMelech, he writes in Tehilim, on the 100th chapter, Mizmor letoda hariu l'ashem kol haaretz, ivdu et Hashem besimcha. That you have to serve God with simcha, with happiness. Serve God with happiness, right? Simcha, and uh, we Moroccan Jews, is a, is a name for a lady. Simcha, uh, simcha, frecha, alegria, they all same name, okay? So we always say, what is simcha? Hey, serve God, right? Serve, serve God with simcha. Um, but there is this concept of serving Hashem with happiness. That's something that's written. That's something that is very beferush, uh, in, in the text. Well, what does that mean? What does that mean to serve Hashem with, with happiness? How does that uh, apply to my own personal happiness? Um, in, the, in the Torah, there are two parashiyot that discuss the curses that will come upon, God forbid, Jewish people if they choose not to perform the mitzvot and they don't listen to God's word. Parashat Bechukotai has about a, a smaller amount, 48 curses. And then in Parashat Kitabo, towards the end of the Torah, right before Rosh Hashanah, there are 98 curses. It's very long. The Chazan who reads these, these curses, the custom is to read them in a low voice and very fast because they're not pleasant. I always tell my students when I want to talk about this, I go, just open up the Arch Chumash and read the translation of these curses scares you. It really does scare you that this is this is what could happen, God forbid, to a person who doesn't keep the mitzvot. And right at the end of those 98 curses, mamash, two sentences before it's all done, Hashem tells us why 
this is happening or why this would happen. Why am I going to, God forbid, eat the flesh of, of people because we're going to be starving? Like these are really, really horrible, horrible things. And, and, and worse, but I'm not going to get into it now because it's a happy class. But why is, it, why is this happening to God's people? And the Torah tells us, Tachat asher lo avadta et Hashem Elohecha, because you didn't serve your God, besimcha utub levav. You didn't serve God with happiness. And you didn't serve God with a good heart. We served Hashem. Yeah, yeah, we did it, but we didn't do it with happiness. We didn't do besimcha. So that's how important it is for, it is for us to serve Hashem, idu et Hashem besimcha, when performing the mitzvah. But the big question is, how do I do that? How do I command a person to be happy? The state of happiness, or, or lack thereof, is caused by many different variables. Um, number one, our bank account. <laughs> that could lead a person to uh, either happiness or lack thereof. Our children could be giving us difficulties and, uh, and struggles. Um, the dating scene, our shiduchim, our spouses, um, so how how can we command someone to feel happy and to be happy? Um, and uh, if, if it's something that is an emotion, and, and the truth is, can we command any? Can we command a person to to express any type of feeling? Let alone same thing. We have a problem with that, with the month of Av. When the month of Av comes in. We have to We limit our happiness. Yeah, but but if, if I'm very very happy, why should I stop my happiness? And how, if I had a bad day today at work, and it's a month of Av, how you, uh, in the month of Adar, how am I expected to increase my happiness? My kids are driving me crazy at home. So therefore, what? Now, uh, how am I supposed to be in a good mood? So it's a good question. It's a good question. Let's just take it another, another place. I have to love your friend. We are commanded. Love your friend like yourself. Everything, everybody in her, I heard that, grew up this in school. There are a bunch of songs made out about it, right? It's a beautiful pasuk. Rabbi Akiva, Zekla, Gadol, Batora. Is it possible? Is it, uh, is it, is it, po- can you force me to love someone? What if I don't like that guy? What if, what if this person accused me of doing something that, that I didn't do? What if this person injured me? Um, he hit me. He stole from me. He, he caused me a lot of And you're telling me I have to love this guy? But I don't want to love him. So is it something that is even possible if it's in the realm of feelings and emotions? So I could command someone to put on tefillin. I could command someone to put up a mezuzah in the home. I can command someone to put on tzitzit if they're wearing a four-corner garment. I can command someone to light Shabbat candles. All that is fine. I can command someone to hear the Megillah on Purim because those are action items. But how can I command heart items? How can I command things for emotion? So Bezat Hashem, I hope tonight to guide everybody here and those listening, you know, how, how we can reach the appropriate level of happiness and the true happiness that we all seek. And it's probably not the happiness that you think is happiness, especially that I've already hinted to you, Ibn Hashem Simcha. So in simple terms, the way to achieve true, true happiness is through love of Hashem, through love of God, Abat Hashem. That's how we reach the happiness we're looking for. And that needs a proper train of thought. And we're going to do that by, we're going to tackle this idea through a lot of stories tonight. All right? We said it's going to be a light class. We have a lot of of really, really great stories. So we open up with a story that took place in Bnei Brak. Bnei Brak is a very, is an ultra-Orthodox city in uh, in Israel. Um, And uh, it's a great shopping city too, by the way. People don't know that. Well, people go there shopping and do things. Um, but there was a big Tommy Chacham who used to pray every morning in Bnei Brak. And next to the shul that he prayed, there was a cigarette factory. Okay, and the name of the cigarette factory was called Dubik. Dubik cigarettes. It was like a wholesaler where they used to manufacture cigarettes. Every morning he would come to shul and he would see a guy coming in with Talit and Tfilin ready to pray. But before he actually entered the shul, he would start his day at the cigarette factory. He would go there, walk in, and then come out. And the guy said to himself, I don't, I don't understand what this person is doing. Uh, he's dressed in talit and tefillin, come and pray. Like, you're ready to come and pray, come 
and pray. What are you doing over there? What are you doing entering that place? So important that he has to go before Tefillah. And what made this even more questionable is that this was a learning guy. This is a person that after Tefillah, he sat down, he learned for an hour or two hours. He came at night and he learned. You know, any any person who has a, a basic level of study knows that before Tefillah, you're not allowed to do anything. You can barely even eat. You're allowed to drink coffee or some water, but that's it. Before Tefillah has got to be the first thing you do. What's this guy doing walking in for, for five, ten minutes into the cigarette factory and coming out? So finally, he saw us every morning. He said, I got to go ask the guy. I got to go ask this guy what he's doing. So he goes, ah, excuse me. I noticed you went into the, you go every morning to the cigarette factory. Uh, don't you know that it's Asur? Asur to go do anything before uh, before Tefillah. Why do you want to a cigarette factory? That's what he says. He says, inside that factory, there is the uh, switchboard coordinator guy. There's a guy that is receiving all the calls. But that guy is blind. Guy can't see. And they made for this blind person buttons with braille, with bump dots that allow them, that allows him to direct every phone call. When someone phone, when someone calls, instead of, he can't see the numbers for the extension, so he feels them to whichever department, whether it's shipping, or it's manufacturing, or it's sales, and he's doing it all by feeling. And every morning before tefillah, I walk into this factory, and I go right to the office where he sits, or, or near him, and I see him from a distance, and I just see him doing this, you know, figuring his way out, feeling his way through, and then I leave the uh, I leave the office, and I say, Baruch Atah Hashem, Elokeinu Melech HaOlam, Pokeach Ivri, that I blessed you, Hashem, who opens the eyes, who opens the eyes of the blind, meaning every every morning we wake up, uh, when we go to sleep, we're blind, we lose our ability to see, and it's a blessing that Hashem opens up our eyes, and uh, and allows us to see, and this is something that I need, he felt, before I come to shul, and I say my, my opening brachot, I have to be thankful of Hashem of what I have. It's a machshavah, it's a thought process. What's the prescription for happiness? There are different levels of happiness. There's one type of happiness we're not going to talk about. That's the one that's based on on shtuyot, on stupidity. That's the one where you have the guys getting, uh, or girls getting drunk or talking about things uh, or ridiculous things in the coffee shop. If I was rich, this is what I would do with $30 million. I'm coming up with their whole plan. We're not going to talk about, we're not going to talk about that. You know, we're going to talk about things that are meaningful, that are powerful. I want to, speaking of powerful, I want to tell you this really, really incredible story. Um, we just had Rabbi Pesach Crow not long ago, and he was the master storyteller. So I'm going to share some stories tonight. Um, it's a really, really incredible story. Read it and blew me away. Uh, there was a young man in Israel, who developed a, a brain tumor. And in Israel, although they have a very high, high tech medical team and all that stuff, um, but they couldn't, they couldn't do the operation that was needed for this man in Israel. And he, he was referred to a hospital in New York to get this operation done careful procedure to remove the brain tumor. And this man had no siblings. This man had no parents. He was an orphan. Um, his wife, he was married, couldn't travel with him because they had children. So the rabbi of this person asked another congregant to be with him, to, you know, to accompany him to New York, to make sure everything is okay. This man had the language. The person with the tumor didn't have the language and have such a strong English. So the rabbi asked him. And the, the story is being told in the point of view of this friend is coming to accompany the guy, the sick patient. So he says, I traveled with this person and I dealt with all the logistics. I dealt with all the doctors, the phone calls, the hospitals, booking the flights, uh, the cabs, because this person couldn't do it. And the surgery was scheduled for Monday, Monday afternoon. And four days before the surgery on Friday, the patient had to go through a very, very intense uh, bedika, a very intense examination where it was it, it 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 contained suffering that you wouldn't imagine that through the main artery they had to inject some sort of material some fluid into the blood that would rise through his through his veins and his vessels and they would it would through that they would know exactly where to operate but when they did this his eyes burned out of pain his eyes literally changed colors because the the the, the the blood was traveling throughout his body. It was a very, very extreme medication, but they needed to do it. There was fire in his eyes. 
doctors were all talking very quickly. You guys, I, I, I thought I knew what I was saying. I didn't know what they were saying. I just prayed, prayed, please end this quick because the guy is going through. This wasn't even a surgery. This is the bdika before the surgery, four days before. So he took him out of the room, finally did the bdika, and they brought him into his own personal room on the 17th floor of this hospital. It was a gigant, gigantic hospital, nothing like this in Israel. And uh, he sat in the bed, and then the doctor came in and told me to translate to him. And he said, from this moment, for the next 24 hours, make sure that this guy does not move. You cannot move, you nothing, because it is so sensitive. He has open cavities in his body as a result of this, of this bdika. He's going to bleed, he's going to bleed out, internal bleeding, and he's done. He can't move. He can't lift his head from the pillow, end of the story. He says, if he needs a drink, here's a special utensil, something that they give him with a straw that the, 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 my mouse can't move. This is how this one's going to be for 24 hours. It's very, very, um, very delicate situation. So the guy is telling him, don't worry, Danny, I'm here. Uh, if you need me, I'm not moving from here. I'm with you. If you're, if you're hungry, I'm going to give you to eat. If you're thirsty, if you're here, he wipes his lips. He goes, listen, I just need... Um, I just need 20 minutes. It's before Shabbat. I'm not going to shul. I'm going to be with you for 24 hours. I promise you, I'm here to keep you healthy, not moving. But I need 20 minutes to find a kosher store because I need to buy some challah buns. I need to buy some grape juice so we could say kiddush, and plastic cups, so on and so forth. But don't worry. So he went down. He found what he needed. He came back up. He prayed mincha with this guy on Friday night. He prayed Arvid Lecha Dodi, started singing Lecha Dodi. Not everybody was happy with this, but he was singing Lecha Dodi in the, shul, in, the in, in the hallway. All right, they prayed Arvid Shalom Aleichem Alachem Hashem Eshet Chayil Kiddush. Okay, beautiful. He did Kiddush. Um, just as he finished Kiddush, two monster, thug-looking nurses, male nurses, storm into the room. Tall guys, wide guys. You may have seen these type of nurses that are very, very, you know, they come in and they show me a piece of paper that they have to take Donnie to an x-ray room immediately. And and they start pulling on wires and moving him. What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? Guys going crazy. What are you doing? Because look, we have to take him orders. And they're, they're literally picking up. You're going to kill him. You're going to scream. You're going to kill him. You can't do this. The doctor said you can't do it. They literally pick him up like a tennis ball, throw him on the bed. The guy can't believe what's going on. But they didn't care. They grabbed him. He goes, I was shaking. I was shaking. I couldn't believe what was going on. What are they doing to Donnie? They're going to kill this guy. And they're rolling him towards the elevator. I'm like, oh, no. Now I got another problem. Shabbat. So what? What? Okay, forget about Donnie. But what about me? He goes, I'm, I'm not sure what to do. Bono Shalom. I'm going to break Shabbat. I'm hearing the thing. I was planning on staying in the room for 24 hours. Uh, can, I, can I enter this elevator? But I can't leave the guy. I promised him I wasn't going to leave him. So I said to myself, you know what? The goyim are going to press the buttons. It's for them. Most people in this in this hospital are for goyim. So you know, I gave myself a leniency and I went in. By the way, Halacha is right. He was right. He was allowed to go in and let the goyim push, push the buttons. There was nothing wrong with what, with what he did. The elevator went down 17 floors to the ground level and then came out and then made its way to another set of elevators and down another two floors to floor minus two. That's where the x-ray room was, minus two. Now, they get to the x-ray room and there's a big line. So, huge line wait for x-ray. So, he goes, I go, listen, Danny, we're here. I have a chumash. I'm going to read the parasha. we got time. He takes up the chumash. He starts reading the parasha. Um, and uh, and he, he started learning. Not long after, another cop comes down from the elevator and parks a few spots behind him, also waiting in the line. There was an older woman, very bad shape. You can tell she was very frail. She was very weak struggling to breathe. She didn't come with any family member. The nurse that brought her down basically left her there. She was alone. She caught hold of the guy and motioned him to come. So she goes over there and she he, he approaches a lady and she goes to him, good Shabbos. Well, he was wearing he was wearing keep up, but very, very weakly he said she said, Good Shabbos, good Shabbos. He said, uh, Shabbat Shalom, good Shabbos. And he goes back to Danny. He goes, hey, Dan, you know, behind me, there's a, a lady, she, uh, she, she's Jewish. She saw that I was Jewish. She said, good job, sir. So Danny goes, and again, very weak. He goes up to Moshe and he says, Moshe, I have to go say kiddush for that lady. He goes, what do you mean I have to say kiddush for that lady? 
Yafse Kedusha that lady. She probably didn't hear Kedush, Yafse Kedusha the lady. But yeah, but Danny, I can't leave you. And the, the grape juice and the stuff is all the way upstairs, 19 floors up. You have to say Kedusha the lady. Now, I don't think she could hear. You have to say Kedusha the lady. Okay, so now, now he can't take the elevator on his own. So he gets up, uh, goes up two flights, manages to find his way outside, but there's electric doors. So now he's waiting in the cold for a guy to come by and open the doors for him. He said it was so cold that he goes, if someone flicked my ear, I felt it would have, fl- have flown off because that was how cold it was. And then he finally gets in and he's gonna go up 17 flights of stairs, 17 flights of stairs. And one, stair, one flight, one flight, one flight, every time, huffing and puffing he goes i don't know how i'm going to do this and he does it again and he does it again he finally gets to the 17th floor the door's locked of course modern day hospital doors are locked you can't just go and everything you need like a fob to go through to go through the door right knocking banging nobody sees him he goes please please hashem i came all the way up here please have someone open the door finally mazal someone opens the door thinking that it was like a bathroom and he made a mistake oh no no no, no, no. and he tried closing he goes no no please 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 let me in and he squeezed his way in he runs to the room and he just sits down because he's so out of breath. And he just needs to relax. Okay, after five minutes, wipes off the sweat, he takes the grape juice, takes the cups, and he comes downstairs, 17 floors, all the way down. Going down is a lot easier going up. Again, comes outside, needs to wait for a goy to come open the uh, electric doors. He goes through, back down another two flights of stairs. He goes to the lady and he says, I'm going to say kiddush for you. And she looks at her, her eyes open like this. She's very, very weak, very frail. And and he starts saying the Kiddush, Yom HaShishi, Baruch HaTah Hashem, and Kaddish HaShabbat. And she says, Amen. And he takes a little bit of grape juice and puts it on her lips so that she can taste the grape juice. And uh, she goes to him and whispers in his ears. She goes, it's been over 50 years since I've heard a Kiddush. And he said, the Germans came to my town, she says, and had to run away. And I hid in barns after barn after barn until I finally came to America. That was the first kiddush, the first blessing I heard for 50 years. One hour later, the woman died in the cot. Didn't even get a chance for her x-ray. And he looks up at Shamayim and he says, Ribono shel olam. I traveled 12,000 kilometers from Israel so I can get one woman to say amen over that she hasn't done in over 50 years. 50 years not here in Kiddush, just for that one amen, one hour before her death. I was not in the hospital for good reasons, he writes. I wasn't in the hospital. Well, I look, look why I'm here. Not happy reasons. Was, but I cannot tell you the joy and simcha that came over me at that moment knowing that she got to say one amen. I made her recite that one amen just before she died, and there's nothing that brings me more joy and more simcha. Powerful story. Powerful story. The Saba Mikelev once, uh, once went up on the Bima right before Shavuot, and he said a very short but powerful speech, and he says, my children, Hashem created the earth. This earth has a circumference of over 40,000 kilometers. Between here and the stars, millions of light years. But it was worth for God to create this world for one Jew to say Baruch Hu Baruch Shemo. And 1,000 Baruch Hu Baruch Shemos equals one Amen. And 1,000 Amen doesn't even equal one Amen Yehen Shemei Rabbah. And 1,000 Amen Yehen Shemei Rabbah doesn't equal to one minute of Torah study. That's what he said in his speech. True happiness, ladies and listeners, is what we're doing right now. True happiness is coming together and learning and and fulfilling what Hashem's will is. Do you have any idea what is happening in, in the heavenly realms in Shamayim right now? They're, they're dancing. They see the shiur and they're dancing, dancing with joy. And every shiur that's going on right now at this time simultaneously, it brings so much simcha. There is no greater simcha on earth than to learn Torah or to perform mitzvah. When I shake a lulav, that's the biggest, that, 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 at that moment, that's the greatest moment of happiness.
things that we can do. Let me tell you the issue with this. What about the suffering? What about the affliction? What about the fact that I had a bad day? What about the fact that uh, I may have lost my job? Or my spouse is upset with me? Or my children are driving me crazy? So how do I do that? Okay, I'm serving God, I'm happy. But there's still realities here that I need to deal with that may not put me in that right state of mind. So I'm going to tell you something from a personal example. Um, I work in education. For some of you that also here work in education. And it's a hard job. You deal with kids and more kids. And uh, you got you to do your marking. And then you got to deal with parents. And you have long nights. And you get home and you're tired and you're hungry. And uh, imagine I come home. And I'm expecting dinner to be on the table. I'm expecting dinner. I'm, I'm, I'm exhausted. I had a long day with the kids. But the kids come to me and say, Dad, there was a power outage. And because of that, the oven didn't work. There's no dinner. Okay. So what do you do? Go to the freezer. Take out a bagel. You frost it. Peanut butter. Right? I'm a peanut butter guy. All right? You peanut butter? Anyone here peanut butter? Okay. Peanut butter. Tell me about cream cheese or butter if you want to go all plain butter. Okay. Okay, so that's my dinner. Right? There's no oven, so peanut butter, or peanut butter sandwich. That's what it is. Next day, I have high hopes. Okay, <laughs> again, long day. Can't be another power outage, right? It just can't be. All right? Come home, Dad. The gas shut off. They did something in the building. There was no gas. Okay, no dinner. All right? Again, bagel, peanut butter. That's my dinner. One more time. Third day, you come home. The rice was burnt, okay? Completely, nothing else to eat. Now there's a part of you that is really upset. It's three days now, you yeah, had, had a proper dinner. So now how do you respond? But before you react in your harsh way, the phone rings and you pick up the phone and you say, hi, Mr. So-and-so, this is uh, John from Princess Margaret Lottery. You won $5 million in a brand new home in Muskoka. Mazel tov. I don't think you said Mazel tov, but Mazel tov. What's the first thing you say in, in response? Uh, okay, it's a joke. It's a prank. Who's calling me? Who, which one of my friends is this? Like, I said, no, no, I'm serious. You want, sir, $5 million, and you got a brand new home in Muskoka. You want. Now, I don't believe you. I don't believe you. You know what? I'm, give me your number. I'm going to call you back and see if it's really it. Oh, yeah, sure. Go ahead. He calls back. Hi, Princess Margaret Lottery. How can I help you? Oh, my God. I won. I really won. I really won the Princess Margaret Lottery. What's going through your mind now? Do you care about the burnt rice? I don't think so. Do you care about your, your third uh, peanut butter sandwich, bagel? I definitely don't think so, right? There's an elation going on. There's an elation because when you have that level of happiness, all your tzaros go away. All of a sudden, all the sufferings, all the pain, all the trouble, they don't matter anymore because you brought yourself up to a, a level of happiness. So we are God's children, all of us. We have to recognize the things we have. Hashem, you gave me life. I could say amen. I could say, I could say kiddush. I could hear kiddush. I can go to school and hear the Megillah. I can study with my friends and, and with my rabbi. And nothing else matters. Nothing else matters if I have that connection. The, the curse that God gave to the snake at the beginning of history was afar tochal kol The curse of the snake was that he was going to eat from the earth his whole life. And the first mass, that's a curse. Uh, and he can eat so readily. Man, no kashrut, no kosher, no COR. Okay. Uh, he's never hungry. Uh, I, I, I've said it before. It it's, 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 doesn't seem to be a curse whatsoever. The snake actually you know, just goes and swallows. So why is this a curse? And the answer is because Hashem wants nothing to do with the snake. Go. Take your food. Get out. I don't want you to connect with me. I don't want you to ask for your food. It's, it's, it's in front of you. The biggest blessing we can have is to be in constant, constant, a constant connection with Hashem, to know that we depend, him, uh, depend on Him at all times. After 210 years, the Jews finally left Egypt. We just finished reading about it recently in the Parash Yota Shavua. Uh, worst slavery ever. 86 years of brutal slavery out of those 210. Uh, not even a straw to build bricks. Not even that they gave them. They were beaten up. They were tortured. It was a mass, like a holocaust, exponentially greater. Horrible. And they reached Yamsuf after being freed. 
and they they're now they got into big trouble. Uh oh, what do we do? Right to see. The midrash says, "Yonati bechag be'asela." See the pasuk in Shiashiri. Oh my dove, the crannies of the rock. Beseti amadrega in the overt of the step. Harini et maraich, show me your countenance. Hashmini et kolech, let me hear your voice. Ki kolech arevu marech nabe, because your voice is sweet and your countenance is calm. This is what Shlomo Melech says in Shiashiri. The midrash says, "What's going on over here?" So that the time that the the Jewish people left Egypt, what does it compare to? To a dove, Yonati, the dove, that was fleeing a hawk. The hawk was trying to chase the dove. But it entered a cleft in a rock in search for safety. And there, in the cleft, it found a snake, found a serpent. And the dove wanted to go deeper into the cleft of the rock. Um, but it couldn't do so. It couldn't do so because the uh, because there was a serpent there, but it couldn't go back because there was uh, there was the hawk. So, so I'm just looking for my thing. Um, so what did he do? So he went to so what what, what what's what's the dove to do now? So to say that's a much, that's what's happening right now with the Jewish people. The Jewish people is they're they're in a situation where they got they reached the, the, the Yamsu, they're stuck. Okay, so what do I do? Go in? I can't. There's a there's a there's a thing. Do I go back? Oh no, I got Paro behind me. So what do I do? So Hashmini and Kolech. Hashem says to Moshe, just 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 pray. Just pray. Actually Hashem told Moshe to go. But the, Hashem wanted to hear the prayers. What does it mean Hashem wanted to hear the prayers? For so long, they were already hearing the prayers. What's it? What's this, what, What's going on over here that um, that they felt that they needed to? Um, sorry, I'm just going to open this up because I'm, I'm missing a sheet here with my notes. Um, what's the reason that they, that they feel at this point that God wants it? They prayed for 86 years. They prayed for 210 years in Mitzrayim. So how can it be that at that at Dafka at this point? That Hashem wants to hear the prayers. And they hear the prayers all the time. So here's the answer that's brought down by the Chachamim. Do you want a question? No. Um, he says, one second. Here we go. Hashem wants us to listen. He wants to listen to our, to our voice. So... Imagine a person, uh, his car breaks down, okay, and he's on his way, and he, and he's, he can't start his car, can't start his car. So we do, in the olden days, I remember this as a, as a little kid, the olden days, when you want a car to start and did start, you need to bring another guy to help you push the car. For some reason, that pushing of the car actually worked. I don't know how. Today, it's just a couple of cables, battery, whatever, get going. But back then, you got to, the clutch, the whole thing, you have to give it that push. So now, you get the guy, he comes in, he starts pushing you, and you're trying to start it, and it goes. Okay, so now once the car starts, okay, I'm done. I don't need the guy to push me from here to wherever I'm going, right? Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay? So um, I just need a little push. But Hashem's chesed is different than your friend. Because Hashem's chesed is something that we require all the time. We came out of Egypt. What do we say? Okay, God, appreciate it. Thank you so much. It's been nice. Appreciate the 10 plagues. Appreciate everything. It's been, no, God, we need Akados Baruch at every moment. We constantly depend on him. We're healthy, Chazak. We found our soulmate even better. But it doesn't end. Hashmin I Kolech, I want to hear, Hashem says, I want to hear your voice. Talk, talk to me. When we have a father like this, how can we not be happy? How can we not be Besim Chana? Chana, Chana was the mother of Shmuel Hanavi. Um, Chana couldn't have a child. Chana, and what made things worse was that her her husband's second wife, Nina, had ten children. Now, these are rival wives, not rival in the term like they hate each other, but they're, they're just rival wives. And to see the rival wife have ten children and you praying and praying and having nothing, it, it, it's not easy. Eventually, she had a child. She had Shmua. And, uh, and she wrote a prayer. She recited a prayer called the Chana's Prayer. It's, it's in the second chapter of Shmua. And the last line of that prayer says the following. En kadosh... Kadonai, ki en biotecha, be en sur kelokenu. 
that there is no one holy like God. There is no one like him. There is no sewer, rock like our God. The Gemara says, don't read the word sewer. Don't read it as uh, no, no rock like God, but sayar. A sayar is an artist. There are no artists like God. This was her, like her final praise to Hashem after having a child. That's what you say? Like, what does that mean? <laughs> what does that mean? You're 10 years barren. Okay, you can't have a child. What kind of praise is this? What kind of praise is this? There's no artist like God. The story of a universal art competition. And where all artists from around the world are coming together in Paris, okay? At the Louvre, okay? To, to with all their great, fancy, beautiful works of art, they're going to have a whole, uh, whole competition. All right? America got art talent competition, okay? In Paris. Big prize, million dollars. Million dollars for the, for the winner. So it comes down to the final two. After all judges and everything, you got the final two. And the, they work some, they work some time to do their artists, their artwork. And the first guy uh, lifts up the, uh, the curtain or whatever, the, the, the canvas, to reveal the canvas. And it's this absolutely beautiful painting of fruit. You look at the fruit. This looks so real. It's, it looks lifelike. All of a sudden, a bird comes from those who manage to get in and comes to the fruit and starts trying to bite the fruit. Whoa, everybody's in shock. Look how real it looks at a bird. It thinks it's fruit. Wow, everybody clapping, standing ovation. Poor guy, the second guy, the second final. He's like, wow, who am I kidding? Like, I got a chance. Ah, whatever, I forfeit. Chazak, I'm done. You know, it's over. No, come on. No, you like, you do something. No, I, I, it's not even worth my time. Look how awesome that is. No, come on. So the guy says, okay, but I want the judge to come and reveal the picture. Okay. Judge goes up and he's ready to pull the string off the curtain to reveal the picture. And it turns out that the string in the curtain is the picture. <laughs> what he thought was a string in the curtain was the picture. Oh. So the first guy, the first guy fooled the bird. The second guy fooled the judge. And that guy won, won the competition. After a woman gives birth, for, for the mothers here, I think we only have one. Okay, <laughs> but after, after a woman gives birth, the first thing she thanks is the nurses, the doctors, the, the midwives, you know, the, the, the pharmacists, for everything. Oh, they're thanking absolutely everybody. And, but where's Hashem? Why, why, why isn't there not, where, where's the thanks to HaKadosh Baruch Hu? The fact is, the first thing that you're supposed to do when you, have, when you give birth is supposed to say a bracha. Supposed to say a bracha. So we need to remember who's the artist. We need to remember... Who, who's making this happen? Uh, it's not the doctor that healed us. They're messengers. It's not the boss that sustains us. He's a messenger. Or it's not the lawyer that gets us out of trouble. He's a messenger. If our mouths were filled with song and praise, if our mouths were filled with praise the size of the oceans, it wouldn't be enough. That's how we serve Hashem Besimcha at all times. One of my famous, one of my favorite stories, and I'll end with this, is um, with, it has to do with probably two of the most famous brothers in Hasidic literature, uh, Rav Eli Melech of Lezhinsk and Rav Zusha of Anipol. Uh, these were two brothers. They have countless stories. Very fair. I was okay to go to Rav Eli Melech in his, uh, in his kever on the trip to Poland. Are you went also, yeah? Yeah, also. Uh, yeah you also, right? I thought you were with yeah, and uh, we went to Skever, Valimach of Lezhensk. And these two brothers, they traveled everywhere. A lot of it was to collect money for their respective yeshivas. And they were once arrested on false charges. Um, now, the truth is, this happened a lot to very, very good Hasidic rebbies that they were arrested. Um, you know, they, in fact, the tradition, they say, goes back, all oh, it's tradition, and, and it goes back to Yosef in Mitzrayim. Yosef was arrested on false charges. And it wasn't a reflection 
of their uh, their piety or god forbid any negative thing that they did because they didn't do anything wrong it was a way of it was in, in the world of, of kabbalah uh, that they were they're lifting up the sparks in the lowest of places they had to be there to to, to uplift the sparks of holiness and that they you can connect to hashem from the literally the bottom parts of the world and you can experience a closeness that can only be felt uh, when you are at the lowest of the low um, so the brothers were thrown into a jail cell that was already filled with murderers and thieves and ruffians and degenerates and really just horrible people, low lives. It was just the worst of the jails is where they were thrown in for something that they didn't do. And the guard throws him to the cell and he laughs at them and he, you know, mocks him for being Jewish. And he points, goes, you need to go to the bathroom. There's your pail points so pale in the cell, a bunch of other people. It's filled with, okay, you know what it's filled with. That's where you go to the bathroom. And this was too much for Abzusha, one of the brothers to bear. And uh, he flung himself on the floor and he started crying, bawling. And Rav Elimelech, his brother, was taken aback. This was not like his brother. Rav Zusha was always in a constant state of happiness. He always had faith that Hashem was going to do things for the good. And he turned to his brother and he rebuked him. And, and, and he says, what are you doing? You're crying, that's Chilu Hashem. It's, it's, it's a desecration of God's name. The cellmates, they're gonna think that, that we gave up hope, that we don't have faith in our God. Why are you crying like this? Rav Zusha looked at his brother and goes, why am I crying like this? What do you mean, why am I crying like this? How can you not cry? Don't you understand? Look where we are. We're stuck in a cell with this pail. And because of this pail of garbage and feces and urine and horrible smells we can't study and we can't think about torah and we can't pray to hashem what, what are we going to do the law is very clear if you're in an area where there is toa feces or or some bad smelly thing you have to distance yourself you have to distance until the smell goes away or at least four four a month and you couldn't do that here so what we're going to do we can't study we can't pray we're, we're done. How can we go on? How can we go on without Torah, mitzvot, and, and prayer? So really not thought about it for a minute, hearing his brother cry. And then he had an incredible, incredible epiphany. And he said, but don't you understand? By not learning and by not praying, we're upholding the halacha that prohibits us from not learning and not praying. We're actually keeping one of Hashem's halachas. So by our not learning and not praying, this is an obedience to Hashem. We are fulfilling God's will. It's amazing. We're keeping the halacha. Every second that we're here, it's incredible, Rab Zushay tells him. We get a mitzvah. We get a mitzvah by not learning. We get a mitzvah by not praying. When else are we ever going to have this holy opportunity to serve God by not serving Him? So Rav Susha's face lit up and he started to smile and he started to dance and then he grabbed his brother and then they both started picking up the pail like, like, like it was a Stanley Cup and, and they're starting waving, it's a true story and they're waving it around like a love and a drug, right? They're going, yeah, yeah, oh my God, look, we're serving God by not being able to serve God. Wow, how lucky we are, this, this is what they're doing. How fortunate that we get this mitzvah. How incredible Hashem gave us this commandment that we're fulfilling. All the people are watching these guys in the cell. What is wrong with these people? They're dancing with, with, with a pail of poop. And, 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 this is, and, they're, and they're happy. What is going on? They're pretty weirded out. How do you sing to God with a soiled bucket in your hand? And he said, oh, maybe, maybe he's praying for a miracle. Maybe he's praying to his God that he'll set them free from prison. Um, so then the other guy, hey, listen, if those are holy men and that's what they're doing and they're praying to get out of here, I want to join. And before, within three minutes, you had the whole cell dancing with this pail of, of garbage and poo and urine, and they're all dancing. At this point, the guard comes back and he hears, what, what's going on over here? What's this dancing? What's this ruckus happening in this cell? So one of the guys goes up and tells him what's going on. He says, yeah, these guys, they're so happy that they got the, the poo the poo pail because now they're serving God by having a pool pail. So the guard says, I'm going to show these guys 
And he goes in and he grabs the poop pail, he washes it out, cleans it spotless, and he puts it back. He says, from now on, if you want to go to the bathroom, you got to go through me and I'm sending you to another room. <laughs> and that is that. And that is that. And he slammed the door closed. And Lebzusha turned to his brother. And they both hugged now the empty, clean pail. And for the first time, they were permitted to say the word, Shema Yisrael Hashem Lokein Hashem Echad. And they danced because that embodied for everything they stood for. Shema Yisrael Hashem Lokein Hashem Echad. Hashem is one. Hashem is one when we can fulfill His commandments. And He's also one when we can't fulfill His commandments. He's the same. And there's never a moment that we, we should not feel connected to Him. He is one and we are with Him always. That, ladies and listeners, that's what Simcha is. That's what happiness is. It's the dance of Rav Zusha, the dance of Eli Melech. It's the dance that we're given, the gift of always being able to connect to Hashem. When we pray, we are talking to Him. When we learn Hashem is talking to us. Simcha is the second out of those four words. But there's one word before that. It's a learning of Torah. It's a coming for sure. It's the inspiration that you get from listening to, to classes and rabbis and online or learning a, a new halacha or fulfilling a mitzvah. That is the prerequisite to the simcha. On the literal level, it just means that we have to learn a little bit of Torah before we actually have a Purim meal. Okay, that's what the halacha says. But it's more than that what we're saying. The true, true simcha needs to be prefaced with our connection to Hashem, with the performance of the mitzvot. There is nothing greater on earth, nothing greater than that moment that you light Shabbat candles. There's nothing more special at that moment because there's nothing else God wants you to do at that moment than light Shabbat candles or say kiddush or shake the lulav, or hear the megillah, or give matanot levionim, or give mishloach manot, or light a Hanukkah candle, whatever it is. That's what God wants you to do at that moment. So why are you going to give it up? And even if, if it's something small, even just to get say amen, a one moment can not only change the, the person's life, but the person listening, the person who got that person. We are all given hundreds and hundreds of opportunities every single day to come close to God. And those are opportunities that bring us true elation, and true joy. It's something that happens throughout the year. That's why it's not It's not we start now. We don't when I've been doing mitzvot all year. But comes Adar, comes Adar, and the, the level gets pumped up. The level gets pumped up because what the Jews did in the story of Purim, Kimu Kiblu Yehudim. Gemara says that when the Jews accepted, the, uh, the, when the Jews were given the Torah on Har Sinai, it was because God took a mountain and said, listen, either you accept it or I'm killing you. Oh, okay, yeah, I, I want to live, so I'll take the Torah. It was only till a few hundred years later, okay, when the Jews were in the, in the time of Haman and Ahasuerus and they were saved from the decree. That's when they accepted Be'ahava. It was no longer forced. It was something that they really, really wanted. And that was the Kabbalat HaTorah. That was the acceptance of the Torah. What happened on Har Sinai was Matan Torah, the giving. God gives it to us. Okay, now we have a Torah. We still fulfilled it. But the acceptance, the Kabbalat, happened on Purim. That is why Adar is so special. That's what makes this month so apropos for reaching levels of spiritual simcha. Um, and, and as much as we cannot force someone and say, I want you to be happy. And I want, and I want you to love that person. And I want, because sometimes it is difficult. But if you see and you look around at all the wonderful things that God does, it's an automatic. It's an automatic. Wishing everybody a wonderful night.